I was asked to um, introduce my good friend, Christopher Chapel, uh, whom I've known, I guess, 10 or 15, oh, at least maybe 12 or 15 years, um, and have uh, come to respect very much as a, a leading scholar and practitioner of yoga and uh, someone who puts his scholarship to good use in the world. Uh, officially, uh, Chris is the Doshi Professor of Indic and Comparative Theology and the founding director of the Master of Arts in Yoga Studies, first of its kind as far as I know, at uh, Loyola Marymount University here in Los Angeles. He's uh, published more articles and books than uh, I can imagine doing in a short period of time. And the rec most recent one is Living Landscapes, Meditations on the Elements in Hindu, Buddhist, and Jain Yogas. Uh, Chris, take it away. Okay, I'm honored to be in your presence. And I'm hoping that I get to know a little bit about each one of you. So I'm going to try not to say too much and when we do go into questions, please identify yourself so that we all can uh, be part of this community together. And I also want to just give a happy shout out to surviving and to whatever we're doing that is keeping us as a people alive and thriving. And what I'll share today is uh, much contained within this book that Phil mentioned that came out, oh gosh, about a year ago. And what um, you're invited to do, of course, is to uh, go to the SUNY website and perhaps, uh, I love SUNY Press. I've been publishing with them since day one. Uh, they always keep stuff in print and they always come out with paperbacks. So. Um, this book is easily available in ebook as well. And what I've also discovered is that with printing, art is not expensive to include in a book. So I commissioned some art that I'm going to share with you. Um, and I'm going to start the screen share actually right away. So what I invite you to do is to lean into your screen. Oh, okay, first I'll honor um, our land. And as you can see here, this is um, a singer sergeant painting in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. This land depicted here is actually in Italy, but I do want to acknowledge the Tongva peoples of the Los Angeles basin who were displaced by a group of Mexicans that came up actually on my birthday in 1791. And slowly the Tongva culture over a generation was marginalized and is only continuing in remnant form. And what we need to do is to recognize that the rhythms that we develop in our bodies are rhythms that were learned by the first peoples wherever we live. And it's our duty to seek out those narratives. It's our duty to seek out the sacred places. It's our duty to find a connection so that we can stabilize ourselves and give honor to the elders that went before. Now, I want to also honor my own guru. And I know this is a group of spiritual directors. I look forward to hearing about you all, but I'm going to share something that I feel I'm in safe company, but actually I've published this. Everyone in the world can you know, do whatever they want with this particular story. But I was a very hyperactive and very needy high school student. And I just looked up into the sky and said, oh, and I had started meditating under the instruction uh, through the book, but I'd also interviewed and met Philip Kaplow, the founder of the Zen Center of Rochester, New York. 
and grew up as a teenager in a community of Zen practitioners who lived in nearby farmhouses. And I used to wander the fields every day. And when Be Here Now came out, I started doing yoga postures, kept up the zazen that I had started when I was 13. And then I had this amazing dream in that transitional summer between high school and college. And I had a dream that Mira Baba, who I had studied carefully my senior year of high school, was walking down Genesee Street in Avon, New York with a plow. And he invited me in to this house, which was actually the home of Christopher Lash, who was the great um, you know, um, historical critic of narcissism. And we had helped take care of that house. It's a long story in the summers. But when I walked into the house, it was no longer his house. It was a 19th century tenant house and Christopher Lash's house is very big and fancy. It just came on the market and it's so little money to live fancy in Avon, New York. But nonetheless, I got to tour the rooms as we had once done, but it was a farmhouse and there was an oak table and there were low bookshelves and the clue corn books and the Kroger books were on those bookshelves. And there were big, comfortable oak chairs that had inlaid tiles of Dutch windmills. And I sat at that table and this woman who I'd never seen her in white in real life, but she was all dressed in white and we just talked. And I don't remember what we talked about, but I woke up from that dream and said, wow. And then I went off to college, and when I went to my eight in the morning philosophy class where we studied the teachings of Don Juan and the structure of scientific paradigms, remember this was 1972, I met a woman who, you know, another freshman who had um, joined the class from Long Island, and Buffalo was largely New York City folks and then a few farm kids like the rural folk like where I grew up from the western part of New York State and she invited me down over Thanksgiving to visit her ashram to meet her yoga teacher of whom she spoke glowingly and sure enough we walked into that 19th century farmhouse even maybe 18th century and we sat at that very table and I gazed on those very books and I just, I said, okay, I'm transferring. So for 12 years, very rigorous sadhana with Garani Anjali. And you can find her, you know, little bits and pieces on the internet. Uh, we had a restaurant for 25 years. My wife and I ran a community education center and bookstore. We had an art gallery. It was really the only thing happening in Nassau, Suffolk County uh, during that period of time of the 70s and into the 80s. And what distinguished her teaching so important was that she was born in 1935 and she grew up during the Gandhian revolution. She grew up during the vital period of yoga in Calcutta. And in the 1943, she became part of a small community of a storefront yoga teacher. And I need to do a little bit more historical retrieval. I should interview her sister or something. I don't really know any details. She was always in the present moment. But what she did share was that her family was from Assam. What she did share is that her surname is Inti. What she did share is that she did as a very young girl, some very profound interaction with very needy people. And having come to study basic nursing in the United States, having married a, um, uh, a Jewish guy from Brooklyn and settling eventually on Long Island and raising three kids, she just had this Samadhi moment that said, I have to share what I received. She was also a Bharatanatyam teacher. She had performed at Lincoln Center and she had just dedicated this ashram when I came for that November visit. So ahimsa, okay, social justice, the work of Martin Luther King Jr. 
holding to truth. Every week we worked with a different yama and niyama. And in my earlier book, Yoga and the Luminous, the chapter that people remember is where I narrate how your worldview changes if you have a theme every week. And we always had two themes, one a yama, the other a niyama. So for instance, ahimsa and santosha, how to be kind and gentle and how to be happy. And even having those words rolling around in your head, it can change perspective. And simultaneously, I had amazing professors, both at Stony Brook and then for my PhD at Fordham. And we were reading in Sanskrit and in Tibetan primary materials. Actually, for my very first semester, I was studying Sanskrit, even up at Buffalo. And um, one thing led to another. The other piece of her training that I really want to share with you briefly today and invite you to consider this in light of the ecological spiritual nexus is systematic meditation upon the elements. Now, as you zone in um, to this painting, uh, created by Gabriela Ayala Canizales, one of our yoga studies MA graduates, you'll see the feet of Mother Earth. You will see a ground filled with flowers. And you will see that groundedness rising up like tree legs into the middle of the body. And in this middle of the body, we see her vision of oceans and soil. We see her vision of the life-giving powers of Mother Earth. And we see Mother Earth holding in one hand planet Earth, in the other hand, the sun. And we see the tresses of vegetation that emerge from her body. And this is a literal depiction of verses from the Yoga Vasishta. And this is the sort of practice that we performed that make possible an earth spirit connection. And our sadhana for the month of October, 1973, was to meditate upon Prithvi, to meditate upon mother earth every morning for 20 minutes and every evening for 20 minutes. And we were to create this, which is a plate of earth. And this is described in the early Buddhist literature and gaze upon this plate of earth and then see what arises through the day. Then the month of November, rather October, yeah, November, October, November, 1973, we were to reflect upon the water. And we were just talking about snorkeling. And I finally went out and got a wetsuit once I felt comfortable going into stores and the ocean is my abode. I was there yesterday and so much life itself comes from the ocean life in the water propels us forward through our own force and through the force of water itself again life-giving milk a form of water and this to me is those radiant sun rays just glinting off the water and as we sat for 20 minutes in the morning and 20 minutes at night, gazing upon a vessel of water, connections happened. And what I learned about dharana, because this is the yoga uh, practice, the um, fifth limb, sixth limb of dharana, is that even if you think that you're not on task, if you go back just a little bit, you're on task. So Jack just took 
a little bit of fluid and she's doing it. She's doing the water meditation. And what I began to discover was that even in my wanderings, I could bring it back to the topic. And we all know the horrors of soil pollution, of water pollution, and how can we not develop empathy when we've made this granular, this cellular connection with water. Okay, so um, the shells, the waves, the movement, and then fire. Okay, gazing upon a flame, and just simply even here, look at the power of the sun illuminating the bottle brush tree and the yucca tree. Look at the power of the sun illuminating each and every one of us on the screen. The light is reflect, refracted, the light is reflected. There's power in our hands, there's heat in our hands. Oops, sorry. Um, there we go. You can see almost like Johnny Flame in the Fantastic Four. And my, my students, they love to relate this to all of those comics and those cartoons that talk about the elemental powers. And we begin to feel the warmth under our nose. We begin to really feel the warmth in our hands and in our belly. And one of the great pieces that was shared early by Garani Anjali was that she was concerned in the early 1970s with the advent of those fully lit athletic fields. I think we all know about them. I rued and lamented when they came to our own campus. And she said this, a full lit athletic field at night robs the power of the sun. And she herself grew up studying to the light of an oil lamp, no electricity in Calcutta in the 1930s and 40s. This is my father growing up in Canada in the O's and the teens from the last century. And our biorhythms get disturbed. And then the other thing is that we're just pulling all of the solar energy out of the earth and creating havoc with the atmosphere. And then air. Okay, the month. Okay, so December was fire and light, which was great because the candle early morning, it's all the light we had. Candle in the evening, the only light we had. And we always in December would do a celebration called Dead Dev Ratri, which was a celebration of all of the holidays that bring us into awareness of light. And then breath, okay, the month of January, the heart, we can take wing. We feel with the largest organ of our external body, with the skin, we feel the touch of the wind. And with our largest internal organ, we bring in the breath that sustains us. And then the month of what would it have been? Uh, it would have been December, January, uh, February, which is a difficult month in New York State. And on the whole East Northeast corridor. But what we were to do was nothing. We were given no instruction other than to occupy space for 20 minutes in the morning and 20 minutes at night. And there's so many ways to do this. The space between me and the screen, the space between me and the trees in back, the space, the psychological space, the emotional space, the community space. Okay. 
so much to explore, so much to review. And she also gave us, in those early years, a few months later, a sadhana to spend time with an animal every single day. And I invite us to consider what Gabriella has created. When we look at the polar bear, we feel the sadness of those polar bears on the ice floes. When we look at the swan, we remember their regal bearing. And those of us who have a little bit of a India training, we think, hamsa, so hum, I am you, you are me. And we look at the comical frog and we can't help but remember the news that frogs worldwide are in distress. We look at the inquisitive bunny who is filled bright eyed with fear and quivering. We look at the wolf and we hear the stories of coyotes in the neighborhood. We hear the stories of the wolves coming down from Oregon into California. And we can be aware of the preciousness of species preservation. We look at the raptor, the eagle. We were walking week before last in Malibu Creek State Park and about seven feet away was a golden eagle right at our level. And he hung out with us for a good seven, eight minutes. I have some great photographs, but the alacrity, the vision of an eagle, the nobility of the tiger, the good luck brought by the elephant, all in continuity with Mother Earth. So we did a series of conferences and books, Phil alluded to them through the Forum on Religion and Ecology. We went through all the different world's religions. I was the focalizer for Hinduism and Jainism. I spent about 20 years working on this book. And the essential message is one of open awareness, a message of feeling that kinship that is our birthright. And in this, we find our no self. In this, we find a spirit of generosity, care, and concern. So I'm going to stop sharing now and just welcome any questions that may arise. And as I said, please, I hope we get to everybody, but please introduce us, tell us where you are, who you are, and what you do. If you feel drawn, you unmute yourself and, and speak. Just as I have the microphone right now, I'm, I'm on Kauai, and I was, and Chris made a reference there just before he began that uh, it, we were talking about snorkeling earlier. And, and for me, this snorkeling is, is entering a world where my physical humanness is repositioned. I'm, I'm invited into a world where I'm, it's fine without me, it's better without me actually turns everything upside down. It's like I, I, I'm a visitor and I, I organically get filled with awe and wonder and want, I'm very aware of my footprint when I'm there. Um, that I'm a visitor on, on this beautiful planet that, 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 that I have to respect. And it stimulates that for me. And I know everybody doesn't have tropical oceans around them but there's trees everywhere, otherwise we wouldn't be breathing. And so I think there is an entry point for all of us 
somewhere there to to allow our perception to entirely shift. Hi, Christopher. Yes, please. I'm Annie Kionaga from St. Augustine, Florida. And recently I heard an astronaut that was part of the 1966 um, flight, he was part of the moon landing, actually. He was a guy that went around the moon while the rest of them were, two were on the moon. And he was, you know, a very down to earth guy, no pun intended. And, uh, but he did say when he, he was asked about, when he looked back at the earth, he said it was it surprised him how small it was from there. And it was about the size of the thumb, you know, um, holding up the thumb. And it was predominantly white and blue because of the cloud cover. And he mentioned the, what arose inside of him was this, oh, it seems fragile. We need to nourish it and nurture it as much as possible. So he shared this very briefly and it was very beautiful to receive this message. And I'm just wondering if you think younger people, because the sensibilities you spoke about right now are so beautiful and I felt them as you spoke. I felt the connection to the elements and, and the, you know, we have not been good, uh, we haven't taken the good care of stewards of the earth. Do you think the younger people are more in tune with that we are part of the earth rather than, you know, dominion over? Do you think that awareness might be rising? Because that's extremely important at this time, obviously, for all of us to feel that way. But I'm wondering if the younger people are more in tune with that. Yeah, it's a very, um blessed position to be at university because we're with the young people. And over the years, I've noticed really two ways. One, depression, anxiety, and helpless and hopeless. And the other is, oh, we've really got to do something. And the tipping point between the two is where, as spiritual directors, our work is set out for us because a lot of the hopelessness comes from lack of connection and a lot of the optimism comes from an actualization of connection and Viktor Frankl of course wrote about meaning and that's what everybody needs not belief but a meaning that's grounded through authentic connection and one of the, the movies that I showed last semester, um, The Social Dilemma, was revelatory for the students because they began to realize that they're being had. And the other movie that I had them watch was My Octopus Teacher, oh, which yeah. won the Academy Award. And of course, for Jack, it's, you know, that's just the world that we love to inhabit when we have the opportunity. And that experience was so exhilarating for the students. And again, um, regardless of economic level, and we have all economic levels at our university, um, this is a, an equalizer. And one of the joyous things about the pandemic is to see that our beaches are once again crowded. Like, where can you go? After a little bit of a close down, you could go to the beach. So people were not spending their money at Disneyland. People were rediscovering the sand and the surf and delightful. Thank you. Um, okay, I want to just- yeah, Alan Levin, okay. Unmute. Um, uh, yeah, I'm Alan Levin. I, I live in uh, the Hudson Valley in New York, uh, about an hour north of the city. And um, I, I really deeply appreciate the heartfelt, heart opening way in which you describe this uh, deep connection uh, in, in to ecological consciousness, what I call ecological consciousness. And um, so my, my question is, uh, that consciousness can, can be enjoyed and experienced in a very subjective way. And some people tend to stay pretty much in that subjective, I find. 
And I wonder, I get that you uh, support or encourage perhaps um, taking that consciousness and bringing it out into some meaningful action that will do something that will affect the endangered species and the polluted air and earth and water. And how do you see that shift being supported by some of the practices that, that you encourage or do meditatively and spiritually? Yeah. I, um, in order for people to engage in the world, they have to have a sense of who they are. And by expanding self-definition to include the elemental and the animal, there can be the building of a resolve. And you can't quite see it, but there's some toyon, which is the indigenous name for the plant that grows well in the California Chaparral, after which Hollywood is named. And this was a science experiment for my son many years ago, 25 years ago. And he sort of tested, how does it do inside? How does it grow outside? And it energized him. And he went on to, and he would be loath for me even to mention this, but he went on to do his PhD in environmental science at Berkeley and is now in a leadership position with the state of California on environmental issues. Now, yeah, he grew up in this house, but this was not because his parents were into this thing with the plants necessarily, but it was that his science teacher took the effort to educate the students about field biology. And that, translates into an inner connectivity where livelihood is inseparable from um, insight. And that's the best that we can hope for as educators. And is this spiritual? I mean, it's just sort of what we need to do in terms of fostering human development. And yeah, I would like to suggest that all resources are needed. And I also want to lift up both St. Augustine, where one of my major professors, I believe, is still living in old age retirement, uh, Antonio de Nicholas with his wife, Maria Calavito, who teaches up the road in Jacksonville, as well as the Hudson Valley. We have a cottage on, out, what is it, Outlook Mountain, I forget what it is, but somewhere out Woodstock Way. And my wife and I are going to be sequestering there with our daughter and her husband in a few weeks. So I love the Hudson Valley and uh, you're fortunate. Well, wherever we live, I mean, Kauai, St. Augustine and Hudson Valley, we're all blessed. So I wish I had a better answer, Alan, but that's about the best I can come up with in the moment. So let me, um, you know, normally this is where we would transition into small groups for nine minutes. If you're up for that, I would like to encourage that. We didn't sort of pre-plan this, but the prompt that I would give, and if you don't want to do it, we can just go one by one around the screen, but the prompt would be explain how nature connection has been part of your experience as a human being, as well as a spiritual being, keeping in mind that wonderful proverb put forth by Tehard, we're not a human being have a spirit, having a spiritual experience, but we are spiritual beings having a human experience. So Jackie, is it okay if we do small group breakouts? Let me suggest something, which is that we have so few people here, only 22, that we yeah. might, and, and enough time that we might be able to just continue as the 22 of us and everyone who wants to has a chance to speak. But that's just my opinion. I may be wrong. What do you guys think? 
Okay, I'm getting a, a, an okay sign from Phil. Um, so why don't we try that? You know, and if we, I don't know, I'm suggest. I, I think. Okay. Maybe so since great. I'm since I'm shooting my mouth off, maybe I'll just respond to your question. Um, great. You know, I mean, like you, I've been meditating and since and doing spiritual stuff since the '60s, and. Uh, so when after I got married, we somehow got onto the idea of camping, which I hadn't done since Boy Scouts um, very much, but at all since Boy Scouts. But we, I was working for the university here, and, and I could take like five weeks off in the summer. And so we got into the habit. Of, we we got a pop up, and at first started with a tent, and then a pop up, and got in the habit of going out west for a, a month and every summer, and choosing a state such as Utah or Wyoming or. Colorado or Montana or whatever, and just doing that state, you know, hiking, day hiking every day for a month and then coming back. And I remember one time I was, we had come back home and I was standing in line at a restaurant and someone looked at me, they said, wow, you look like you've absorbed a lot of beauty or something. So what have you been doing recently? And, and it just, we had been doing that, you know? So, you know, if, kind of that's, we haven't been doing the camping much anymore, but, um, Throughout the pandemic, I've been hiking in the woods for an hour and a half every day and uh, skiing when there was snow. And somehow I just find it very, it's kind of like part of my spiritual practice these days. It's very rejuvenating and uh, kind of so essential. Rick, Rick, yeah. Rick, where is your bioregion? Where are you? Iowa. In Iowa, great. Yeah. Western, central, or eastern? Uh, southeastern and um, yeah you know, Fairfield, Iowa, there, there are more pigs than people by far in the state of Iowa, um, but not within a, not very close to us. And so <laughs> we can just, you know, it's, it's nothing to, to brag about in terms of beauty compared to where you and Jack and, and other, some other people are, but um, yeah, it's good. No, you got the best electric storms on the planet. Pretty good ones. Yeah. And we have good friends in Buena Vista and um, yeah, it's a great state. Yeah. Um, and just to throw in another quick thing here, as you were speaking, I was thinking about the different perspectives I've heard from spiritual teachers uh, about the environment and about the fate of humanity and all. And they range from like Catherine Ingram, who wrote a, a, an article about how we're pretty much all going to die soon. And uh, she's moved to Australia to live out her remaining days. Um, I, die soon because of what's going to happen to to with global warming not because we're all going to die soon anyway um and then you know other and then francis lucille once at a, at a science and non-duality conference david loy got up on the mic and said well how about the environment you know and he, he was like oh the earth is like a speck of dust it doesn't matter what happens to it and uh and <laughs> um and you know since the asi is all about people you know, the importance of ethics in spiritual teaching and teachers. Um, and since it seems rather unethical to me that everybody on earth dies because of the misbehavior of people um, uh, collectively and individually, I'm, I'm just wondering what the role of the SI and of spiritual teachers could possibly be in helping to foster an awareness of behaviors which might turn the tide in terms of, um, you know, what's happening with climate change and all the other forms of environmental desecration. Yeah, the immensity is staggering. And we're about to have a thunderstorm, by the way, you just mentioned the electrical storms, here it comes, <laughs> here it comes. <laughs> That's great. We need some thunder and lightning here and some rain. But um, yeah, the immensity of the problem can be quite debilitating. But if with our clients, and for some 20 years, I've been longer than that training yoga teachers, and I've trained hundreds and hundreds of yoga teachers in the techniques of focused attention to the elements. And what this does is sort of twofold. It slows people down. <laughs> and it also allows them each in her or his own way to arise from those moments of connection to a place of resolve. 
And then the smallest examples, as I mentioned earlier, are the ones that become memorable. And back in the 70s, when I used to have hair on my head, I used to blow dry my hair. And what was the worst that would happen? It would freeze if I would go out. Um, but, you know, I just stopped using the blow dryer. And even men remember the blow dryer from the 1970s. Okay, so that was just one small stepping away. More recently, I think that we're all aware of the plastic problem. And one of the things that we did is that we dusted off our yogurt maker and we make yogurt every week. Then our, you know, our glass containers and our plastic has reduced. And when we go through the farmer's market, you know, with, and these are the simple little things. Now, are they enough? No. Are they enough? Yes. In the aggregate, we do what we can do. And the conscientization uh, that Paulo Ferreri spoke so eloquently about is now taking grip throughout the globe. And when I was living in India in 2019, and you know, India is in the news for all the wrong reasons right now. But the commitment of people to get away from plastics for more than 20 years is remarkable and encouraging. Uh, and we can do the same in what little we can do and then accept that yeah, uh, there's still a long road ahead. But thank you, Alan, that, that was great. And I celebrate your, um, your campaign experiences and what we've done with our family, and we're still doing it 30 years every April. We just got back a few days ago. We're at Joshua Tree and just that intimacy with place is just so important. Okay, how about Catherine Bell? Yes, I, I'd be happy to speak. I'm, um, I'm a dream coach. I live in Santa Cruz, California, and we had really bad wildfires uh, last August. Actually, I was just noticing you can see the fire, the burned trees up behind my house. Um, we, our house was spared, but you know we were surrounded by the fire, and I was evacuated for almost three weeks, not knowing if my house had survived. And it just it brought in a lot of uh, sense of of urgency um, and I've you know been working on my own you know PTSD around it like you know just like seeing the, the burned trees and and like how how to come to terms with um, with my strong feelings and how to kind of harness those feelings in a way that's useful rather than feeling overwhelmed and like well I just I'm just gonna I don't want to see it I'm gonna move somewhere else you know so a lot of people have left here we had lost almost a thousand homes in the county and uh, um, the fire and how do I harness the um, the trauma of um, of this destruction and I uh, like you know and it can be applied more generally like how do we I think you talked about this in, in relationship to the children like um, there people can go to a place of being overwhelmed and just you don't know what can't do anything and feeling overwhelmed versus how do you harness the um, the earth sense of urgency into something meaningful. Um, that's what I've been mulling over, especially during this conversation. Mm. It's so powerful. And a, a close colleague's husband is a firefighter. Mm. And one of the most, and talk about PSTD uh, or PTSD. Um, when the mudslides came in Montecito, one of his jobs was to probe with an iron pipe, trying to find, and he never did, the body of a, a two-year-old that had been swept away. Mm. And these are moments that can lead to permanent trauma, or they're moments that can inspire us to do what we can with the resources we have. And we do have good mental health resources. And as 
people committed to the work of spiritual direction. We also have small tools. And one of the things that, you know, I, I learned about fires my very first year here in California in 1985. And within a few weeks, I was standing on our bluff looking at Malibu on fire with the fire coming straight to the boundary of Pepperdine University. And this is the way, this is the rhythm. This is how nature ebbs and flows in California. And the indigenous people knew this. And the indigenous people all through the continent, even in the Genesee Valley, would stage periodic burns to purge the undergrowth and to even manage the wildlife. And one of the joys of the burned out areas, and I'm sure you're experiencing it again this year, is to see the irrepressibility of life. Mm -hmm. To see those redwoods just regenerate. Mm -hmm. To see the incredible flowers that even with our low rainfall this year, probably bloomed right outside that window that you'd never seen before. Mm -hmm. And by making that rejuvenation process a focal point, I think that we can find a moment of healing within ourselves. Yeah, it's helpful, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Christopher, just a quick point. Um, during the pandemic, especially in April and May, there were a lot of stories about how the resurgence of nature, because there were no cars on the road, you know, there were, dolphins in Venice along the waterways. I mean, I would see this time and time again, how nature rebounded so beautifully. I mean, not maybe not completely, but there was a lot of hope in that message at how given us just a chance to have an, you know, a, a the essence of all the pollution and that nature could come back. So that was just a very telling time in terms of what's possible. And I think it was also, a matter of attentiveness because the birds have been flying for millions of years have people taken the time to notice right. and there was this beautiful rhythm for several months here where about 100 crows would fly south at dawn and have a meeting and sometimes i would happen upon their meeting and then the same 100 crows would again gather and fly north it's sunset and they aren't doing it now, but it became this moment mm -hmm. of how long have they been doing this and why haven't I been around to notice this? A lovely story in the paper today about a family who had to leave their home in Torrance in the South Bay here because a type of swallow came I mean, by, the, by the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of swallows came in their chimney, took over their house for a day, and then they left. And it turns out this is a well-documented phenomenon. They used to go into a chimney in downtown LA, but they chose Torrance this year. And the bird people are saying, yeah. And the other people are saying, what's going on here? How did this happen to me? But I love, uh, we've invited Lynn Margulis in uh, 1991 to come to our campus. And she's the great theorist on Gaia. She was married to Dorian Sagan. And she lamented as, you know, we heard a, a little bit before that, yeah, the human being is not doing too well. It would be a shame if all of the creativity of the human were to disappear. Probably someday it will disappear but we know who will outlive us and that will be the cockroach. <laughs> yeah. Oh, great. They Every have their time, place, I know. <laughs> they have their place. And what Thomas Berry would remind us is that if we have so much diversity in our midst because of the love of God, God certainly loved beetles because there are more species of beetles in the pantheon of life than any other being. Mm. So every time we see a beetle, you know, look twice. 
So Susan Bird, if we, oh no, here, there we go. Chesare Alfin, and then Susan, if we've not heard from you, but Chesare. Hi. Where um, are you? I'm in Ojai, California. Oh, so lovely. A little bit, yeah, near, and I, I could show out my, my door here. Yeah. The oak trees and the, yeah. Um, I, I, I teach periodically at Cretona. So yeah, Ojai nice. is close to my heart. Nice, yeah. Um, I was just reflecting on a friend that just uh, led a plant spirit herbalism conference with a lot of diversity in who was showing up, people of color, people, native people, and white people, which I hadn't seen in an herbalism conference. And they were all talking about um, their spir like spiritual aspects of the connection with nature. And... Uh, I was impressed by how many people showed up to this conference. There was like 5,000 people and my friend put it on and she's just one girl my age to worked for two weeks. And all these people, all these presenters, all this inspiration, this action about, and I asked her, how the hell did you do that? Like, how did you get 5,000 people to come? You know, what did, what did you do? Do you just know like networking really well on the internet? And she said, she just got overwhelmed first, which I think is some of the conversation that we've been having about just like, ah, and then she went outside and the, she listened. You know, she just went to nature and she felt the bees like come and this bee energy come and gather and kind of swarm through her. And, and then she felt this plant that had this energy of like this piercing, like, del like confidence. And then this plant and these plant spirits are here. Like, I feel like always speaking to us. And uh, when I was just so desperate and lost in the past, like really um searching and seeking i would just leave i would just like grab an avocado and just go into nature because at least there there was some sanity you know and so i just feel like listening to nature like listening to nature automatically there's there there's so much available especially here with the spiritual it's like that's where it's at it's it's always communicating what can you do what steps can you can you be moved by these these plant spirits that and the ground that want to move through us? So I just, yeah, I wanted to add that. Yeah, the listening, it's the best. Yeah. Yeah. And congratulations to your friend. What a great story. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Susan. Yes, I'm Susan Bird. I'm currently living in Connecticut. Uh, um, is down near the ocean, Long Island Sound and the Connecticut River. Uh, and I grew up in Southern California near Los Angeles. And that was my first experience of nature was being able to walk in the woods. We had woods near the house. And just as a tiny child, it was fine to just go into the woods and be alone. And I think that started a lifelong love of trees and woods. Uh, so seeing, seeing California is, is joyful for me today. <laughs> it's, it's, it brings back so many, so many good memories. We also would go up to Yosemite. My grandfather had a cabin up there near Yosemite, and we'd go up every summer, and just it was safe to go off for as a, just a small child, just to go off, and you'd see all kinds of animals and creatures. So it, it kind of developed a lifelong love of being in nature and having nature really be this, if you could call it a spiritual practice, because I don't have anything I could call formal in, otherwise. Um, so I, other places I've lived is Puerto Rico. So the Caribbean was another place and uh, in the Blue Ridge Mountains and now Connecticut. So it's, it's, uh, it's been fun for me seeing where everyone's from. It's, it's like it's a chance to experience it, just listening to everyone. Um, I'm interested in the idea of what could be done with ASI in terms of, of, of service with people. I, I think workshops or 
I don't know exactly what, what we could do, but I think that's a really important uh, thing to consideration and uh, uh, to see what comes out of this. And I appreciate so much you being here. It's, it's so inspiring. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. When you talk about the Connecticut River, um, and I got I married in 1974, and we were living on the North Shore of Long Island. We biked to Orient. We took the ferry to New London. Oh. But then the only way to get to Bridgeport was on the I-95 for part of the trip. Oh. So there we were biking the I-95 oh over the Hushkatonic <laughs> River. And it was like, oh, why did we ever leave Long Island? But we made it. It yeah. was. Um, a uh, very strange honeymoon. <laughs> <laughs> Bad enough being in a car on I-95. <laughs> I can't imagine a bike. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful, though. It's a beautiful river. It's it really river. is, yeah. It goes up all the way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Hey, Alan, you want to check in again, huh? Well, I wanted to check in in response to your question about how we connected to nature and um, two things that helped me as a suburban raised uh, boy uh, really deepen my awareness and connection were one participating in a, what was a kind of a vision quest, a rite of passage in nature that was led by Stephen and Meredith Foster who and taught me how to guide people. And I did for about 10 or 15 years and um, so the immersion of, of being alone in nature with a sacred intention is a very powerful way to, um, sometimes with fasting, we used to do it with fasting uh, for four days. We went in the Inyo Mountains and Joshua Tree and places in mostly deserts in Southern California. And uh, it, to reintroduce rites of passage into our culture seems to me to be a very important way that we can help people make that shift, um, nature-based rites of passage. The other, the other thing, uh, to, just to put it out there, is uh, hallucinogenic plant medicines that also can teach us uh, that Mother Earth and Father Sky and all the elements are with us at all times and we can open to them uh, deeply and um, be moved to do what we need to do on this planet to help, you know, shift the destructive course that we're taking as humans. Yeah, I like uh, Houston Smith's take on entheogens. And when he was with us on our campus, the question came up and he said, yes, it's sort of like a telephone call. You get the message and then you hang up and you carry on. And the retreat into nature is so important. And with our own children, as they turned 13, we did rite of passage ceremony. And then as they were graduating high school, they did 28 days and nights in the Eastern Sierra. And one of the things, uh, and this is a little parenting tip, but I don't know if, if it will be useful at all, but having grown up in the Haudenosaunee, the uh, Seneca lands, and having learned the importance of dream through Thomas Berry of the people indigenous to my, to my home and with whom my father had trained a relate, with a related tribe up in Canada. But what I would always do is ask my children if they remembered their dreams. And when they would go on that vision quest in their senior year of high school, they said, yeah, we had to do our four day, four night solo. We slept a lot. And all of their friends were having epiphanies because they had really never been with themselves before. And my children were very chill about it, which I thought was sort of a good tribute to let's just integrate with waking up every day and being attentive and being, uh, you know, um, remembering of what the night has brought. So I'm wondering, David Beaver, can we hear from you? Sure. What would you like to hear? 
<laughs> uh, where you are and how you connect. Uh, I'm in the Research Triangle in North Carolina. Ah, uh, beautiful. And um, I've been teaching for about 45 years. Um, you got me beat. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> details, details. <laughs> um, but uh, my, uh, my day job is I work with the astronauts uh -huh. and the experience that they have, the so-called overview effect experience that they have in space. I'm a cognitive researcher, so I did the cognitive research on that. The reason I bring that up is because there's a great deal of talk that sometimes comes from them that the earth uh, is very fragile. That's what they, the way they see it. But actually that's not, that's not very true. The earth has been around for four and a half billion years and life has been here continuously for at least four of those billion years. And, and it, it has taken, the earth has taken much heavier hits than mankind can deliver to it. Um, what is fragile is human society. And what is happening with the ecological problems that we're facing is that we could easily see the breakdown of the social structure itself. Yes. Um, I worked with Edgar Mitchell for about 15 years mm. uh, getting the Overview Institute started. And while his experience in space led him to form the Institute of Noetic Sciences to focus on the nature of human consciousness, about the last five, six, seven years of his life, he shifted more to sustainability because yeah. he said, while shifting consciousness, basically the work we all do here, um, is the only real solution for the world's problems, if we don't figure out a way to create a sustainable society, we're not going to be around in a coherent way enough to continue this work. Um, Society is very fragile. I think we've seen that with the pandemic and a number of things that have happened recently. So my question has been, and I've been sort of pushing this in ASI, <laughs> Jack, yeah. Um, if we listen closely to the environmental scientists, we probably have no more than a decade or so to sort of get a handle on this, not to stop it, not to turn it around, but to mitigate it enough so that we don't face tipping points that may be unrecoverable for the rest of the century. And, and so my question is, what role does the spiritual community and spiritual teaching community have in this? Certainly any of us, I think, and you have really expressed it very deeply that the connection with nature is central to both our practice and to the nature of the reality that we are we are falling back into, trying to fall back into. But, uh, and, and so this is the long-term solution. I'm, I'm with you completely on that, but that's not going to happen probably in the next decade on a worldwide scale. Is there some way that we can use what we do to help shift this cultural stuck point enough so that we're going, you know, um, internet and bat gap and ASI can stay in motion long enough to get some things done. That's my question, I guess. Yeah, it's such an open-ended question, such an important question. And my teacher had a song, I am doing what I can, are you doing what you can? Do what you can, I'll do what I can to make us all happy in this great big world. And that's the short version of the song, but you know, a little bit Don Quixote, you know, we are tilting at windmills and the metaphor of the windmill is an apt metaphor, particularly as I go back and forth from Joshua Tree. Um, and I'm reflecting on the conversation between the now dead Queen Mother and the Dalai Lama. And he asked her in her hundredth year, and she was born, I think, in 1900, you know, you've seen it all. You've seen the Depression, you've seen the rise of the fall of the Soviet Union and the Cold War, you've seen World War I, you've seen World War II. Are we getting better or are we getting worse? 
And without missing a beat, she just came back with this positivity that we're doing better. And if we think of the incredible destruction of the 1940s, and we think of the mustard gas of 1917, um, so far, so good. And the fact that we have been pulled by our very fractured culture back from the precipice of sort of unimaginable cruelties uh, and our awareness of the shortcomings of various hegemonies come more and more into consciousness, particularly with young people. I think there are occasions for hope. And as our friend in Santa Cruz said, a thousand people lost their homes, but thankfully the loss of life was not as significant as it would have been without modern communication systems. So um, small solace, but what can we do? And I'm so thrilled to be in the presence of someone who worked with Edgar Mitchell. Uh, that's, that's really quite an honor. So Renata, tell us where you are and who you are and what you do. Hi, uh, yeah, I'm Renata Akika Ladantek. I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm originally from Prague. What's nice about on Atlanta is that, you know, when you like uh, fly to the airport in Europe, you know, or in Prague, you, you see the, the city, you see, you know, the houses and everything. If you fly to Atlanta, you just see green, you know, <laughs> you get really close. So the trees are beautiful and really tall here. Um, so this is, has been really like a rich conversation. And I'm thinking about what David was saying that, you know, we are, we are not damaging the planet Earth, you know, we are damaging ourselves, we are damaging our society. Uh, so that, yeah, that makes lots of sense. I'm also on the board of trustees for uh, Universal Worship, which is a Sufi uh, organization. It's like an interfaith uh, group. And we are thinking how to incorporate the care of the planet into services. And so, you know, I joined this webinar specifically because I just wanted to get sense, you know, what would be meaningful, what would really make sense. <laughs> so it's not just a talk. So it's something that people can really tune into. Uh, yeah, and just, yeah, it's just, it's really beautiful to just hear all of you talking about, about this. It feels like it's not, it really needs to go from, you know, I don't know. I used to work for Greenpeace when I was younger. Mm -hmm. I was about to you know, protect the earth and protect the whales and da da da. Uh, but now I feel it's more about the attunement and really feel, you know, the, the, our connection to Mother Earth in our bodies, in our you know field, and and that's maybe the way how we can actually save our society in and the connection and the planet, you know, the whole ecosystem. So I'm here just to listen right now. You know, I just kind of soak it all in. Yeah, and I'm, I'm reflecting that it's Ramadan and remembering being in Istanbul and sharing dates and honey at a Maklevi center before the dance started. And it's a powerful moment to recognize all the different ways in which people establish this relationship with food and with meditation, so important. So Catherine Schultz. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Cool, hold on. So I, uh, oh, can you see? So I am in Asheville, North Carolina. And I'm at the base of a mountain that kind of unfolds into a mountain range that I'm going to move to where my husband and I are building a kind of arc, which we think is sort of funny <laughs> and interesting given we, it's been very driven. We've been very driven to do this, but this is our like a little beautiful 
space. And we got married at Arunachala and have had these connections to mountains. And I'm sitting with this cute cat. And I've been a mother late in life. So this interesting dance of Gaia, science, I'm a sociologist looking at, can we socially organize in bliss in the principles of oneness with all things. And about, I think it's like two and a half, three years ago. And I just heard another spiritual teacher um, contracted Lyme disease. And I, as I'm petting this cat, there's a tick. <laughs> And I, it's been a very interesting experience to be present for, um, in my own practice, the idea of the whole on with Ken Wilber and integrating, always being whole, simultaneously part of a larger whole and the, the dance of the creative process where something's always bigger and um, greater than you. And yet you're, you're so intrinsically part of it all. Shoot. No, I'm getting up here. We can hear you, no problem. Oh, someone <laughs> called me. And so this is the dance. <laughs> yeah. So, but with it, what's been so interesting to understand our microbiome level through, through this tick bite and how if, if my body was, this body was, you know, thousands of years ago hiking the Appalachian Trail or whatever it was, and it had had a tick bite, just one of this bacteria would be nothing for the immune system. Fast forward to modernity and you get a tick bite and whatever that mixes through international travel, travel through scientific experimentation, whatever you wanna say, this will dance of the, all of what comes into the bloodstream that wants to be use the body as a happily as a host to connect <laughs> and spread. It's like another whole universe of activity that kind of provides, it creates a kind of traumatic event that can be witnessed and yet the body will go through its process. And the recovery takes, again, a, a much more modern understanding of um, nature where like ozone is important and hydrogen is important and the sun and herbalism and you know all of these things that you have to sort of include and transcend and integrate to potentially even recover. Um, so it's this dance right now, I think with post-modernity of going back and how do we reintegrate and include and transcend another level so I, I am very hopeful in so many ways, but I do think that our role as spiritual teachers is to still keep supporting the I and thou are one, um, any place that there's sep separateness to keep supporting the connectivity and understanding of evolutionary interconnectivity. So it's not just uh, cancel culture, it's include and transcend. <laughs> So we collectively can evolve where some countries have zero footprint right now they know, and they're taking other countries trash. And so there's a lot happening, but I think there is a shift in consciousness that um, will be important for a critical mass if possible to, and see where we land. If the tools are there, it'll help. You know, like you're saying the sustainable tools, but somehow the brain has to come up with it. <laughs> Yeah, so, this is this is share. why. Yeah, this is why I'm suggesting that the small connections that are empirical and real, rather than the abstractions, are so important because through focusing in on the very small, we automatically are drawn into the large in a way that's not an abstraction, but arises from what Thomas Berry lifted up as the need for intimacy, intimacy. Yeah, intimacy, right. Yeah, so Tim Wilkerson, let's hear where you are and what you're up to. Um, I grew up in the Midwest around the Kansas City area mostly, but I'm living in Southern Indiana right now and it's really beautiful here, uh, very peaceful place, a lot of nature around, a lot of lakes and woods and national forests. And uh, 
I ran, helped to run, my wife and I, Terry, uh, ran a uh, herb festival mid, called the Midwest Herb Fest for about 14 years. And most of those events were held here in southern Indiana. And it called people in from all around the United States to come and live in a tent, you know, for a, a, a weekend, an intense weekend. And we had teachers, uh, plant ID walks. Uh, we had a, a mid, what we called the Midwest Herb School, where we taught people how to process these plants. And so it was a real get back to nature situation. And we eventually moved to that place. And I spent three years, three or four, <laughs> Uh, on 270 acres of my friend's land living in a trailer. And so I got really close to nature and it was, it was uh, real good for me because as a child, I, I preferred nature's company over people. And I spent a lot of time alone in the woods. And, and then of course, you know, I grew up and I went out into the world and da 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 da. And this kind of all brought me back into nature again. And it's been a very rewarding, complete circle for me to be able to teach and to show people the importance of nature and how we can thrive and be healthy because of it. That's so beautiful. My good friend, David Haberman is quite an activist out of Bloomington and has just shared such joy with what happens every spring in, in Southern Indiana. It's a beautiful part of the country. Yes, it is. Yes. And we look forward to hearing your song. I'm hoping that Jackie will send it out to us all. Oh, please, yes. Yeah. It's, a, it's a little, got some good imagery, I think. I wrote it, but. <laughs> yeah, excellent, excellent. So I also had a lot to do with yeah. the uh, pagan festivals. And they're mm -hmm. all about being in nature and worshiping nature and the four directions. And, and I got to study with Native Americans the same way I've done. I quit counting at about 50 purification lodges that I've been in and, and got to learn from actual indigenous people who I think govern the land. I mean, their element is earth, whereas maybe white people's is fire. Yeah, sadly. <laughs> and and uh, the the African nations or the the black people, their element is water. And the Asian, if you you know can call it the Asian nations are air. And so, uh, you know, we, that was an interesting thing to learn uh, and, and see how each of those elements influences that particular race or whatever you want to call it. Uh, like the Asians learned uh, about the winds in the body and they flew kites and they did fireworks and uh, mm -hmm. the Black Nation did uh, uh, discovered plasma and were the first to do irrigation, build boats. Um, and of course, you know, the indigenous and, and the white people, you know, made fire water and bombs and internal combustion engines and anything to do with fire. So I thought of that while you while I was listening to you speak on the on the different elements. And I, I also teach alchemy, which is all about elements, making purified medicines out of uh, out of plants. Yeah, there's an alchemical base for, you notice there were mantras with the illustrations, an alchemical base for the yoga practices as well. Yes, yes. Yeah, I yeah. studied with Frater Albertus at Paracelsus College in Salt Lake City. Okay, Back cool. in 83. So. Wow, wow. So how about Taysa Lord? Hi, everybody. I'm Tezza Lord. And close, but no cigar. <laughs> I too, like Annie, I live in St. Augustine, Florida. It's a very popular place for spiritual people. <laughs> and um, I'm just so happy to be here. Gosh, what a, what a tribe. Glory, hallelujah. <laughs> it's just so wonderful to be with people of like-minded intention and background. And, you know, we, we can cut to the chase. We can just go really deep, really fast. And uh, just to give you a little background of me, I'm an artist and an author. And I was a botanical illustrator for many years with Schultes at Harvard, who is uh, mm -hmm. really, really renowned for, you know, inventing the whole ethnobotany approach. And I've been working with earth scientists since the 70s mm -hmm. and very aware of my role of being a chronic clear 
of my journey, my own personal journey uh, first because of the way I express myself, my own narrative. And then as I matured <laughs> and I stopped running away because I fled America and I went to live in the West Indies basically. And I went to live right in the heart of the jungle mm. and it had a lot to do with inter-island shipping of fruits and vegetables and helping really peasant farmers organize into co-ops. Mm. And um, I just love nature so much. It's the artwork, for instance, that you showed Christopher at the beginning, it just makes my heart sing because mm. um, a lot of my work is marrying all different species. <laughs> There's no such thing as just one person with a human body. It's half plant, it's half serpent, it's half bird have water. I, I love personifying everything, the oneness consciousness. And it's funny that somebody mentioned plant medicine because um, my botanical work was all with plant medicine. And I drew the first species of the coca plant that hadn't been done for hundreds of years. It was really mm. a pleasure to work with studies. And so I, I'm very close to the plant world, but I am totally um, what you would call a clean and dry person. <laughs> I don't do any substances. I'm totally into meditation, but I loved Michael Pollan's la last book yeah. about microdoses being so helpful with things like schizophrenia and just, it's marvelous to recharge your psyche and plant medicine in small doses is really good, but I don't touch the stuff myself. And, uh, and when Catherine, you were mentioning Lyme, our family has been very involved with Lyme disease. My uh, stepdaughter and my husband both uh, were diagnosed and she had long-term, she got it actually from North Carolina camp, be careful. And she had uh, a long time and healed herself with Chinese herbs and the Rife machine, if any of you know about uh, energy work. Yeah, right. So. Uh, what I'm mostly interested in from this conversation is how we can all help because, of course, we all have such deep experiences with nature. I myself live in a jungle today. I, I'm a xeriscaper. In the middle of suburbia, I have created a Costa Rican bamboo forest, but I'm also a podcaster. And I decided um, two years ago, my husband and I went on a vision quest in a tent and a, a car camping we were gone for six months before the pandemic and we started podcasting about our deep connection with nature wherever we went. So when the pandemic began, we just took the podcast into the inner journey. And now we're getting ready for another couple of months of camping. We're leaving at the end of this month. And so podcasting has really been effective. Uh, a lot of people are addicted to podcasts. So um, I'm interested in that. Maybe ASI wants to get together a, a podcast for maybe they already have it. I don't know. And I also like the idea of, of us as a group doing some kind of workshops available because, gosh, when you think about nature attracting 5,000 people for a, for a workshop like the other gal mentioned, wouldn't it be great to have workshops available and do this like deep nature resonating work with whoever shows up that would be a joy to participate in so i just want to tell everybody hello i finally connected i missed the last meeting because i'm a techno nerd and i look forward to doing some more work with you all Thanks. wonderful <laughs> wonderful how about we hear from mark primavesi i love your name because of you know important people have that name <laughs> Dude. Yes, one of them particularly, as far as I'm concerned, yes. Um, I'm in the UK, uh, in Newbury, which is just south of Oxford. So I'm quite far away from any of where you are. Uh, the landscape here is very much smaller, on a very much smaller scale. And I do envy the large scale um, uh, panoramas that there are in America. Um, I'm in a funny place still at the moment because um, I lost my wife exactly two years ago, tomorrow. And uh, she has been my main guru on um, ecology uh, and 
e ecological theology in particular. And where I'm at from her work and my own work, I don't regard myself as having a connection with nature at all. I don't regard myself as part of nature. I am nature. I am one with nature. The fact is I'm just asleep most of the time and I'm trying to find ways of waking up to being part of nature, not being part of nature, of who I really am. And uh, I, I, do, I do one or two exercises walking up to the top of a hill behind the house here uh, each day. Uh, being with the brothers and sisters around me quite deliberately. Also, breathing practice is very important for me. I breathe in and know, uh, first of all, I was thinking I'm breathing in the breath of ancestors, but even that has, has become far more a unity now. It's not, uh, it's not ancestors, it's everybody, uh, alive and ancestral. So uh, I'm beginning to find ways of becoming one. And my recent thing is because, um, because Anne has become an ancestor, I am becoming aware of how our ancestors are very much part of us now, probably more so than when they were, as we are now, these tiny little pinpoints of, of consciousness in the whole universe. And what I'm asking is that the ancestors walk with me when I walk and that they be present to me and that I pray, may I hear what you hear through my ears. May I see what you see through my ears. And the ancestors I also ask to join me are the great ancestors of the traditional religions, for example, or anybody. But I've been definitely trying to do this with Yeshua Bar Miriam, who I think uh, is an important guru for me. But now that I don't regard him as anything different from anybody else, I know that I, he is with me in exactly the same way as Anne is with me and all the others. So that's where I'm at at this precise moment. I'm trying to see if I can understand who they were with deep listening and deep seeing and have very sharp antennae to see whether there's any bullshit being talked about them by anybody because there's an awful lot of it, and myself, of course, my own speaking, and a lot of these things can't be talked about at all. But we have to talk. We have to try and communicate and be with one another. So I'm in a very small place and quite a dark place at the moment. Uh, I'm very well, I couldn't be with the Quakers on Sunday because they regard themselves as a community of light. And my darkness was so deep on Sunday, I could not, I didn't want to inflict any darkness on them. Even to share them and ask for help, I didn't think it was right. But it doesn't matter, it will pass, all these things will pass. And I just hope, Emmanuel, please reveal yourself. Shekina, please reveal yourself. May I know your presence, if that gift is to be given or not. My experience of deep grief is that it takes three years for that cloud to begin to lift. And our first experience of deep loss was 30 years ago exactly where three people near and dear passed. One, a Quaker, who brought us together 
in Quaker meeting, my wife and I. And as he passed 30 years ago, he said, you never get over someone's passing. You integrate their presence into your gifts to the world. And for each of us, we have that tremendous responsibility to honor those ancestors, to give what we can to one another by way of inspiration, particularly to younger people in our midst. And I just wanna thank you, Mark, for sharing the darkness. And don't be afraid to go back to meeting because you don't have to say anything. And it's okay because it's only through the darkness, the Isha Upanishad, it's only in the darkness that we grow. Where do the roots find our source of sustenance in the total remove of life? And by sinking deep in the earth, we find the stuff of renewal. But thank you so much for sharing and thank you for affirming what I thought was the case, but yeah, your wife's work, so important. So Andrea, Timar. I, I'm gonna have to interject here because yeah. we're just over the time. Um, my apologies, Andrea and, and Christopher, we've, we've got to pull it in. Yeah. Um, drawing this to a close, there's there's two things that come to mind. Um, Christopher, you've, you've just opened and continue to open a platform which we're, we want to build on it and open further. Um, what I'd like is, do you have some final words? Is there a place you can point us to? Uh, what's your parting message? Like trees we connect beneath the surface and we share common work expressed in so many myriad forms. And that in moments, even electronic moments of connectivity, we draw strength from one another and we just keep moving forward toward the light into the light, informed by the light, but nourished by darkness. Thank you, Christopher. I, I would like to um, invite everybody, um, and Jack, you can, or Rick, you could tell us how, uh, to share any um, places organizations that are uh, doing good work at the intersection of spirituality and the environment. Uh, in, in the spirit of what Chris just said, uh, there's just so much we can do as individuals, but there's, there are things that can be done collectively and there are things that are being done collectively. Uh, and, and we could, uh, if we knew more about who's doing what, we could uh, find it easier to to plug in wherever wherever we can and um, do something about the occasional indifference uh, toward these issues that arise in spiritual circles. People could email the ASI with any links or names of things and we could you know organize it all together and then send it all out to everybody as a kind of a follow-up to this video, this conference. Great idea, Rick. Um, so if, if you guys send it, send it into the ASI, we can put it in the next newsletter. Just make sure you're signed up for the newsletter so that we can put all those connections on it. And also I'm going to make a giant presumptuous leap here. And I'd like us to continue this conversation. I'm listening to Susan and, and David Beaver who's from day one is like, what are we doing about the world? You know. <laughs> And, and all of these um, voices from our souls of like, 
there's something that we could be doing and we don't quite have the languaging yet. I keep getting that feeling through this call. And so maybe in our members only meeting or non-presenter meeting rather um, uh, in six weeks time, I, I think it would be good if we, if we teased this a little bit further to, to see what we can do and to dig deeper into the, the questions that were opened today. That's for members and friends, but it's a non-presenter meeting. I would also say uh, to people that they should uh, Google uh, Chris's program at Loyola Marymount in the yoga studies uh, program where they have occasional, um, well, fairly frequent guest speakers that um, you know people can access online. Um, uh, Chris, what's the? Can you give us the uh, how to find that? Yeah, LMU Graduate Yoga Studies. I'll just put that in. It's easy to Google. Thank you, Chris, for doing this. Honored to be here. See you Thank around you. LA soon. <laughs> yes. Thank you, everybody, you for, uh, for joining our community today. Catch you down river.